Good morning. How are you? Uh, well, it's, it's delightful to worship with you this morning. I have all kinds of comments, but I think I'm just going to kind of go with the script. Uh, so last week we worked on Proverbs 27.12. So it, uh, if you weren't here, this is kind of weird. We don't normally do this, but we're going to do this because last week we suggested that we should memorize Proverbs 27.12 and said that you won't lose your Jesus card if you don't, but nonetheless, some of us did. So are you ready? Uh, the prudent see danger and take refuge. But the simple... Keep going. Cyrus memorized it. He's having a baby tomorrow. He had time to memorize it. But uh, he's not having a baby. His wife is. Uh, but the simple keep going and suffer for it. Ready? One more time. The prudent see danger and take refuge. The simple keep going and suffer for it. Way to go. Good job. If you weren't here, you're off the hook. Uh, okay, so la- uh, two weeks ago we started a series of teachings that we've been uh, calling Take Me Home Shammy, a title that we'll unpack a little bit this morning. But really what we've been dealing with is something called the principle of the path. And the principle of the path simply says this, that direction, not intention, determines destination. That the road you get on uh, determines where you end up far, far more than your desires determine where you uh, will ultimately end up. And while we recognize that this is true when we get onto the Mount Helena you know, trail system, we recognize this is true when we're going to go on vacation, you know, that if we don't get on the right road, that we won't end up where we want to go, and then mom and dad will get in a big fight, and it won't be a fun vacation anyway. Uh, What we've said is this also is true uh, in our finances. It's true uh, in our marriages. It's true in our spirituality. It's it's true in our careers, in our work, uh, that that our decisions, uh, they fall on paths. And I think central to to ultimately what we're doing here is pushing back on the human tendency. uh, You know, the Bible talks about being predisposed towards sin, that, that we're We come from the womb uh, with the desire to rebel against what is right and true and beautiful and good. Uh, And I I think in our terms, uh, we could say that there's this desire to want to believe that decisions don't have consequences, that particularly bad decisions don't have consequences. You know, when someone's living well and they're healthy and and maybe even wealthy, uh, we want to look at them and say that's luck. That's because they're family of origin. We, We push back on the suggestion that they've actually made some good decisions that have led them down that path. And likewise, I think there's a tendency that when we end up uh, with a broken relationship, when we end up uh, with financial turmoil, when we end up in a place with our relationship with God and it's tattered a little bit, uh, there's this desire to want to convince ourselves that that's not uh, the result of our decisions. And while I recognize that uh, there's some danger in being too formulaic and too simplistic, I I hope uh, what's happening in hearts is, well, I know it is. In fact, two stories this week, uh, one of a high school gal and another of of an adult 40-something, and I'm not going to share stories, uh, but that Sunday afternoon went home and made significant decisions as God is challenging them to go, wait a minute, so these decisions do matter, and they are leading somewhere. Because ultimately, the tendency is to have financial goals, to have career goals, to have marriage goals, to have spiritual goals, right? We have these aspirations, we have these places we want to get to, uh, and then to end up in places uh, that are contrary to our, our desires, and then to throw our hands in the air and get mad at our parents and mad at our aunts and uncles and mad at our bosses and mad at our teachers and mad at God, and say, what gives? And, and I think, again, at the risk of being calloused, uh, what we're saying in this series is there's this principle that permeates the whole text that says, well, what happened was the principle of the path, that direction, not intention, determines where you end up. And so last week, uh, Proverbs 27:12. Ultimately, what we said was, uh, we used this image of a wall, at least it's my favorite image from last week, that the prudent, uh, what what they're ultimately calling the wise, they they see a pending wall. You know, they have their, uh uh-oh, that's going to hurt, that's going to be dangerous, you really ought to moments. And they see the wall, and and they respond appropriately to that data. While the simple, uh, they see the wall, whether it's spiritual, relational, financial, and they go, eh, eh, it'll take care of itself, eh. When I, when I get there, you know, I really ought to, yeah, I know, but then they do nothing. When I, when I get there, it will have taken care of itself. And I think, uh, as one guy says it, you know, there's some principles that God puts in place. Y- you can try really hard uh, to push against the principle of gravity, but it's not going anywhere. And what I would suggest to you is that what we're dealing with here is, is one of God's principles, that direction, not intention, determines destination. So to summarize the whole deal, I think what we could really say is that our, and what we're saying is that our current decisions uh, impact our future realities, don't they? That the decisions we make as 14-year-olds or 25-year-olds financially will impact our financial futures. And we could say this about our marriages. We could say this about our relationships in general. We could say this about our careers. 
But does it bug you? Uh, if I could put my, I need this tool. If I could put my deconstructionist hat on a little bit, because it's the hat that I like to wear the most, but I don't think God is particularly amused when I wear it. Uh, does it bug you a little bit that you make a decision and that decision impacts your future? But if we're to be honest, and I think part of where you could push back on this series a little bit, is that oftentimes when we make these decisions, we make them with limited information, don't we? Uh, there, there's people in, in our world today, this isn't news to you, who are in deep financial trouble, but, but it's not because of neglect. It's not because they weren't studious. It's not because they didn't think uh, with great detail about finances. It's because they made some financial decisions with limited information, and so they're living in this uh, current reality of, you know, wrecked finances. But, but it's not because of neglect. It's because they made decisions with limited information. Uh, we could say this about marriages. Uh, you probably know somebody. Maybe, you've, maybe you're in a marriage. Maybe you were in a marriage where, uh, you know, two people sought all the counsel they could seek. Uh, they, they, you know, interviewed each other to, to the greatest degree any of us know. And a few years into marriage, it became clear uh, that they made a decision or that one of them made a decision without all the information. Does it bug you a little bit? Like, like what we're saying, and I think it's true, obviously, because it's what we're, you know, it's true. Uh, what we're saying is that our decisions impact our futures, and yet what I'm saying is we make decisions, and even when we make them with intentionality, we make them with limited information, and yet when we make them, we're still stuck with that reality. And when we get to that reality and we realize that we made decisions with limited information, it's not like we get to go back and change the decision, is it? You know, like Bill and Ted, they had an excellent adventure. Remember that movie? dating myself and if you haven't seen that movie you need to rent that movie although I don't endorse it because I don't remember how clean or unclean it is I did watch Short Circuit last night with the boys and that was boring but anyway uh, remember that movie that was terrible but they really liked it uh, you know Michael J. Fox got to go back to the future but the point I'm making is we don't, we don't get to do that do we kind of makes me want to stick my thumb in my mouth and pout and say well, you know it's all up to chance it's all up to karma it's all up to luck I mean, because really what it comes down to then is that uh, the principle of the path is really about having great information. That uh, it's about great information plus a little bit of luck or a little bit of chance or, or whatever it is you want to call that. In fact, uh, I think taken to its logical end, uh, if this is true, then probably the best thing we could do is hire some, uh, you know, really database-driven people, I know a few, and, and have them assemble all the decisions that have ever been made like in the last 500 years so that when we have to make a decision, we can kind of consult the database and it'll tell us like, well, 75% of the time, this was the right decision. And I think, you guys, that without the God of the Bible, I don't mean God small g, I mean without Yahweh, the God of the text, the God who says, I'm a for you, I'm not against you, I'm benevolent, I'm... I'm I'm kind, uh, God who, who says, I have a path of life for you. Without the God of the Bible, I really think that what I just described is as good as it gets, isn't it? That when it comes to our futures, uh, all we can do is try to garner as much good information as we can and then just hold out hope that the information we're missing doesn't come back and bite us in the butt, so to speak. But with God, uh, and this is what we're going to explore this morning, uh, I think with God, there, there's, a, there's another option. Uh, with God, I think we could say, like, what? what if there's something more valuable than good information? Because taken to its logical end, what we've suggested over the last two weeks is good information is huge. But what if there's something even more valuable than that? What if there's something, uh, when it comes to asking the question, which path should I be on, or how do I know if the path I'm on in dating this person and living with this person in my budget, uh, in, in my current spiritual disciplines and habits. How do I know if the path I'm on is a good one? I, I think there's one thing that's maybe even more important than information, and even good information. We're going to get to a guy named Solomon. And, and just uh, for those of you that aren't familiar with the Bible, Solomon is this remarkably wise guy who's responsible for several books in the Bible, particularly the Tanakh. Well, they're all in the Tanakh, which is the Hebrew Bible, what we would call the Old Testament. He wrote the book, a book called Ecclesiastes. And uh, my two cents is this. If you're less than 40, don't read it. Because it's just depressing. Because uh, ultimately what Ecclesiastes says is there's no meaning in life other than to fear God. And so it's a guy saying everything I ever did was a waste of my time and a waste of my energy. So just fear God. I'm told that if you're older than 40, it makes a lot of sense. But if you're less than 40, don't read it. 
He also wrote a book called The Song of Solomon or The Song of Songs. And you should read that book if you think that God is a prude or boring or that God isn't a big fan of uh, sexual relations inside the marriage relationship. Because Song of Solomon is what, you know, 11-year-old boys snuck into the temple and read a couple thousand years ago. It's this graphic portrayal of, uh, you know, a new marriage relationship and the sexual relationship inside of marriage. He also wrote a great deal of a book called Proverbs. And Proverbs, if you've never read the Bible or you don't even believe in God, it's a great read. Uh, one of the cool things about Proverbs is there's 31 chapters. And so some guys, I think Billy Graham is one of them, uh, they have a habit of just reading one chapter a day. You know, and if you miss a day, then you just look at your calendar and you know where to read that day. Solomon wrote a great, great deal of Proverbs. And, and here's the deal. Uh, he was the third king of Israel. So you had Saul, who started good, ended bad. You had David, who started good, ended uh, kind of bad. Uh, David was, you know, he was kind of the George Washington or the Vince Lombardi of the king of Israel. He kind of got them on the map and pushed them into the next stratosphere of existence in terms of the kingdom and wealth and all those different things. And so Solomon, his son, took over. And when Solomon took over, he was rather young, frankly. And, and there's this moment, you can read about this in the text, where it seems in a place of vulnerability, he kind of said, okay, uh, Lord, intimidated by the adventure. And God said, what do you want? You want wealth? I'll give you wealth. I'm going to kill your enemies, I'll kill your enemies, which is kind of funny and disturbing all at the same time. Like, honey, wake up, we've got to make a short list. Why? Well, God's going to help us out with that. <laughs> anyway, uh, Solomon said, hey, uh, I just want wisdom. God, just, just give me wisdom. And God's response was, I'm going to make you the wisest man who's ever lived. So my point is this and all of that. Uh, if ever there was a guy in the history of humanity if ever there was a guy who, when, when asked the question, how do I know which path to be on? How do I know if the financial path I'm walking is a good one? If ever there was a guy who, when faced with that question, uh, had the opportunity to rely upon his own intuitions, his own experience, his own brain, his, his own knowledge, his own intelligence, it was Solomon. The wisest man who ever lived. Uh, therefore, if ever there was a guy who could say, yeah, uh, you know, when I want to know which path I'm going to be on, I just think about it a lot. And then I know the right answer. And yet Solomon's uh, answer is actually a little startling. He's essentially, and you can read the verses that precede this on your own, but he's essentially asked the question about the path, and he says this, a verse that will be very familiar with you if you spent any time in church, but hopefully we can, I don't know, shine some light on it this morning. Trust in the Lord with all your heart. Uh, do not depend upon your own understanding. Some of you are used to the, the NIV translation, lean not on your own understanding. So Solomon's asked, uh, and really what he's dealing with here is wisdom for youth. He's asked, okay, so how do I know which direction to go? And Solomon's first deal, when it could have been, well, I just think about it, uh, Solomon's first response was, trust in the Lord with all your heart. In other words, what Solomon really gets at, and we'll unpack this more in a little bit, is, is the key to the right path, he would say. It, it's not an information issue. It's a surrender issue. It's a God issue. You, you don't need good information. You don't need a database. You don't need an engineer with Excel. You need God. You, you, you need God, which is uh, around here uh, maybe a little more simplistic than we often make things. But, but I think if we stop and we check ourselves, I, I know for me, my habit, uh, I've grown accustomed to not saying my opinion, but to say my view, which is a way of softening my opinion. I, like we, we deal with a scenario, whether it's our scenario or someone else's scenario, and we draw upon our experiences, we draw upon our knowledge, we draw upon our seminars, we draw upon our education. My, my view is, and Solomon says, hold on, hold on, hold on. Don't lean into your own understanding. It literally means to bear the weight of. Like don't, don't allow your brain and your experiences to bear the weight of which path. Put that weight on God. And one of the things we'll explore this morning is that this is a really ethereal reality. To say, trust and learn with all your heart, lean not on your understanding, can be offensive because it's so nebulous. It's so non-concrete, isn't it? It's so ethereal. Like, how did, what does that look like? And yet all of us can think of situations, hopefully, particularly those of you who follow Jesus, where you've submitted stuff to God, and there was no formula. There's just this reality of leaning not on our own understanding. Here's an illustration of what it looks like to lean on your own understanding. I invite you to Now it's all about the golf game. How's your back? Tight. Well, untighten it. 
Because Nishimura, he uses golf as a metaphor for life. So if you mess that up, it's uh, sayonara, Nishimura. My little magic pills. My housekeeper happens to arrange them in an organized, circular fashion. Oh, right? Don Juan. Yes. It's amazing. When did we become our fathers? It's amazing. Man, I like to see troop leader Barry deal with the side effects of even one of these little puppies. Look at this. For my aging prostate, right. side effects include swollen tongue, dry mouth, and pus-filled cankers. <laughs> This one is a joint anti-inflammatory. Maximum dosage may cause bouts of uncontrollable appetite. No, it's not so bad. The munchies, I can deal with that. Look at this one. High blood pressure. Watch out for sudden loss of depth perception. This tiny pill lowers your bad cholesterol. But the first time I took it, partial facial paralysis. Come on. Oh, yeah, I froze up like a circus clown. I was like, ah. Uh, yeah, like, I can't have uh, <laughs> Threw my back out. Man. Yeah. Why is Charging not in here? Keep getting in Dad's way. He can't do any business in here, right? Check if they have any kids' toothpicks. That old people stuff. Should we tell? I think I remember where they go. Candy bars on you? Mm -mm. Don't lie to me. What's wrong with you? I don't know. Hey! Hey! You made it! We made it! Yeah! Can we go play? Oh, yeah, go ahead. There's games over there. Go check it out. Catch you later. Wow, you got a lot of friends. Oh, well, they're not actually all my friends. It's a bereavement group I belong to. Bereavement? Yeah, my grandma passed away six months ago. Oh, I'm sorry. Everyone here is dealing with loss, and then on the weekends we have a potluck. Potluck? Where? It's for Nishimura. It's an honor. Nice to meet you. Oh. My son. Hey. 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 Thank you. We are dedicating lunch today to our brave Justine, who passed away just two days ago. Boys, Mayor. No, sorry. It's me. I think we switch peers. I love cupcakes. She left us a gift of one of her world famous rhubarb pies oh. that she baked through her pain of the last few oh. hours of her life. Good mercy. Now talk, Nishimura. Calm. Are you ready? <laughs> Justine's rhubarb pie. Where is she? I want to give Justine a big hug. She's dead. <sighs> My condolences. That's a close second. <laughs> My face is twitching. You look great. You look great. Charlie, are you okay? Hey, oh, 
I am so sorry about that whole pie thing. I mean, it must be my blood sugar or something. It's okay. I think I calmed them down. <laughs> uh, come on, we're having circle time. Circle time? Uh, yeah, it's when the whole group gathers together and shares their grief. Oh. Hey, guys, I'll be back. I gotta go to circle time. Um. Hey, Dan. Hmm. How you doing? I recently put down $3,000 on an authentic Japanese kimono. I just want to make sure it goes okay. Like to use my club? Is that a yes? Why is he ignoring my father? Oh no, he's just really intense. He excludes all but the game. A focus you could learn as well, my son. Dozo. Oh, oh, I knew oh. it. Oh gosh. Oh. Breathe. Great. Just, just breathe through it. Oh. Walk it off. Walk it off. We're good. We're good. It just passes and then... I mean, it comes back. After nine months of excruciating pain, the cancer had spread. We're all here for you. Do you think this is funny? He thinks it's funny. Everyone agrees in their own way. It's true. If I, if I don't laugh, I'll cry. The golf gods look favorably upon you. Uh, that's funny, isn't it? Uh, an illustration, a better illustration than any story I could come up with from my own life. Uh, an illustration, right? of what it looks like to lean on your own understanding. And we kind of laugh at that, like, yeah, you know, nobody sorts pills on their own and so they can figure this out. Well, not everybody. Uh, <clears throat> we, we don't do it that way. But, but I do think that we, we, we say things, uh, not verbally, but we think them things like this, like, oh, I was a kid once, so I know how to raise kids. Uh, I, I've been married before, so I know how to be married. I've had money since I was six, so I know how to handle money. Like, I've, I've been following God for five years, so, so I know what these next... Uh, five steps need to look like, these next few years need to look like, which, which is kind of like, a, I've had surgery before, so I can do surgery, right? It, it's, it's illogical. Solomon, trust in the Lord with all your heart. Do not depend upon your own understanding. Uh, if you get nothing else this morning, here, here's my two cents on this, and I think Solomon's two cents, is that surrender uh, is really the first step when it comes to knowing which path to be on that surrender or submission is far more valuable, far more important uh, than good information. He, he goes on, he says, uh, seek his will in all you do, and he will show you which path to take. Uh, in other words, uh, include God in every path. As you deal with every path in your life, uh, include God, because you don't need information, you need God. You, you don't need more knowledge, you, you need a savior. Include God in every area. Here's, maybe you've seen something like this before, but, but here's you know, our best attempt to talk about the different paths. Yeah, no, the one, yeah, no, we blew it. The one before that. Yeah. Here, I, I think, is the way we typically, and if you're a Christian, you can see, you know, there's a God component, and if you're a narrate person, then you see, oh, yeah, we, we recognize that God calls us to serve, but we kind of divide our lives up this way, and this might be one way you could think about the different paths in your life. Here's another image that I think represents Solomon's take. That, that it's not that God gets a slice of the pie, but that God is included in every piece of the pie, so to speak. That in every path, in every different component of our life, we include a God component, a surrender component. Uh, you've probably been in a situation where, uh, and we've talked about this kind of hypothetically the last two weeks, where someone shares with you their harrowing experiences of, and they're now unpacking for you their brokenness, and it leads to the question, now what do I do? You know, 
whether it's a friend or a parent or, or a kid or a coworker or a daughter, or whatever. And, and there's that, like, what do I do? And, and those of you that are, um, you know, kind of straight shooters and not afraid of conflict, what you, well, if, what you're tempted to say is, well, I don't know what you should do. What I can tell you is what you should have done two years ago. Ever been there, right? Like, I don't know what you should do, but it's pretty clear what you should have done about six months ago or about eight years ago, which we don't say that because it's a little harsh. And if you did say it, the response you would get is, well, of course you know, because now that all the information's out, hindsight's twenty twenty, right? Like, now that everybody, now that everything's unfolded, of course you know what I should have done because all the information's out there, and so, yeah, it doesn't take a genius now. To which I think uh, Solomon would, would say, yeah, exactly. Like, God is in a lot better relationship with your future than you are. And, and I don't know, I, I don't want to go too far down a tangent of God's sovereignty. And I, uh, if, if you want to, you know, we had a conversation about that on Christmas Eve and trying to kind of deal with the tension between free will and God's sovereignty, between God's control over the future and not. But at the very least, what we can say is there's some dynamic relationship between uh, God's predestination for you and your free will and the choices you make. But at any rate, no matter you know how far you tip the scales to one way or the other, what you have to acknowledge is that I think what Solomon is saying is that is God, uh, God has a better perspective of the future than you do. I, I was running the other day up Warren. I was finishing up my run that morning. And so I was somewhere in the neighborhood of the central school. And as I could see up ahead of me, there was an avalanche uh, trying to get out of a really tight parking spot you know, along the curb. There's a car parked up close behind her, and I could see that there was a little car parked right in front of her, and there was, you know, you could tell that the wheel was cranked and the nose, there was somebody trying to get out, and I could see that there was also a person standing like this, giving this person guidance. And I could see her doing this, and the, and the guy on the truck wasn't moving. And as I ran by the avalanche, <clears throat> what I could see is what the gal trying to give the direction could see, and that's what was that there was about three feet between the bumper of that avalanche and the car in front of her. But the gal driving the avalanche, right? Like, she's frozen. She was not moving. I'm not going to point out the fact that the two women, just kidding, that's terrible. Um, sorry about that. Uh, I don't know what I was talking about. So, so she's not moving, and the gal's doing this, and as I ran by, I could see what the gal doing this could see, and that's that there was these three feet, and I had this thought, uh, maybe in a little bit of grumpiness, like, well, if you're not going to pay attention to her, then tell her to go sit down. Like, trust her or don't trust her, but the fact of the matter is she can see what you can't see. I think that's the, the image of, of Proverbs here. Like, surrender that stuff to God because uh, he's been around longer. He sees out ahead of you a little bit more effectively. Uh, we'll finish with 3.7 or the first part. Psalmist says, don't be impressed with your own wisdom. Which, could we just acknowledge that that's all of us? Solomon, the wisest man who ever lived, if ever there was somebody who could have relied upon his own wisdom, he's like, don't, don't do it. I know you've been to the seminar. I know you have the degree. I, I, I know you've you know, been alive 70 years. I know, I know, I know. Don't do it. And in fact, Solomon himself is an example of what it looks like when you do. Because he's a guy who lived this remarkable life early. But one of the tension points of his life was the national security of Israel. You know, they're this little tiny nation surrounded by these massive nations uh, Israel is very strategic in world trade at that particular juncture of history. And, and, and what God said to him, and you can read about this as you read about Solomon's life, God's uh, repeated statement to Solomon was, trust me, trust me, trust me. Eventually the tension got the best of Solomon, and he did what conventional wisdom said to do, and that is you marry the wives of foreign kings. The idea was, you know, you marry the wives of these surrounding nations and you become their allies that way because no king wants to invade and kill his own daughter. That was conventional wisdom. And eventually Solomon surrendered to it to the extent where we know that he had dozens, hundreds of wives, many of whom were for strategic military purposes, uh, maybe not all for sexual exploitation, but because he couldn't handle the tension anymore of the national security of Israel. And the result was, obviously, uh, he was crushed. And if you know biblical history, you know it didn't end well for him. Shortly thereafter, the kingdom of Israel divided in half. And it wasn't long after that that there was no more kingdom of Israel. The smartest man who ever lived struggled with the same stuff we struggle with, surrendering to God. So as you wrestle with, how do I know which path to be on? I know this is ethereal, you guys. But 
I would say God says uh, it begins not with good information, but with surrender. And so a couple questions that I'd give you this week to noodle on and wrestle with. Uh, first, is there an area in your life where you're not surrendered? Is there, is there a path in your life? It might be a marriage path. It might be a financial path. It might be a career path. It might be a degree path. It might be a spiritual path. Is there an area in your life where you've just not surrendered? The, the take me home chamois thing. Uh, some of you know that I had the privilege of going to Portland twice a year for three years with my friend Brian Hopkins, who leads Journey Church in Bozeman. And, he, you know, like he's a guy who has an iPad already, so he's always ahead of the curve technologically. And so the first time we went three years ago, he shows up with this fancy GPS thing. Never traveled with one before. So he plops the thing out on the dashboard of the car, and uh, the place we stayed was out in the boonies. And so I, if you'd asked me, uh, like six months ago, what the name of the town we stayed in when I was there, I couldn't have told you because we just used this GPS. Well, she had a particular voice. Notice I called her she. Uh, it had a female voice of a particular accent that earned her the name Shamiqua. So we, we called the GPS Shamiqua, and there was two other guys that stayed with us, so the four of us, we always called her Shamiqua, and the other guys in class with us and the other gals would be like, who's this Shamiqua you guys are always talking about? Eh, we don't have to go there. Uh, that quickly became shortened to Shammy. And I never drove in Portland, you know, it was that whole, like, you know, one driver's license on the rental car thing, so I never drove, so I never really interacted with Shammy. Uh, personally, I did hear her advice and wisdom and counsel, and every once in a while she would say, when legal, or when possible, make Yugle legal U-turn. That's hilarious. Uh, anyway, we had lots of fun with Shammy. But I borrowed my dad's when we went down for graduation in April. And I don't know if you've ever driven from here to Portland, and th therefore through the Tri-City area. But it's the most remarkable set of highway systems you've ever been on for 15 minutes. It's insane. I didn't count. But you, ch you literally change interstates and highways without stop signs, without stoplights, like six times in the span of about 10 miles. Can you testify? Anybody else been there? It's insane. Like, I don't know who designed it. I think it's the same person who designed the streets here in Helena because it's nuts. <laughs> so... So, you know, it's past lunch hour where, you know, the classic dad thing. We're trying to push a couple hundred miles extra. We should have eaten lunch. Everyone's a little tense, mostly me. And Shammy's barking out orders like crazy, like, and 1.1 miles, take a left, on the highway, blah, blah. And one time we got off an interstate, and then, um, but again, we didn't stop any lights or anything, just kind of took a merger, and then back onto the same interstate we'd gotten on in a few miles. So I'm convinced that Shammy's lost her mind, and we're driving in circles. And so I'm getting more and more agitated, and, I, and I'm kind of frustrated because I didn't even bring an atlas. Like I so placed myself upon the dependence of chamois that I didn't even stick a map in the car. But I made note of a Walgreens that we passed a couple miles back. And finally, we're, we're kind of through all the mess. And at one point, she says, in 1.5 miles, take a left onto, and I don't remember the name of the interstate or the number, but it was headed east. We're going to Portland from Helena, and now chamois says, like, get on I-25 east in 1.5 miles. I looked at Teresa. My, my mom and stepdad were following us. And I just flipped a U-turn, drove back to Walgreens, stormed into Walgreens, and bought this atlas, and walked out to the car, and they're all kind of glad-handed and having a good time, and I'm just ticked, you know, and I'm looking at this atlas. Ah, I've got to get on I-25 East for a few miles. All right. So I got back in the van, and I gave Shammy her authority back, and we made our way to Portland. It's about surrender. It's about submission, isn't it? That God is a God who says, I, I want you to live on a path of life. But I'm going to need you to trust me to get you there. And sometimes it's going to make you mad. And sometimes it's going to be uncomfortable. And it's not always going to be a field of daisies. But surrender is the key to knowing whether or not you're on the right path. And yeah, it's ethereal. Sometimes it's, it's nothing more than, okay, Lord, would you? Would, would you, Lord? You've been in a relationship. There's somebody you almost married. There's a job you almost took. There's a college you almost went to. And the only thing you kind of didn't even say out loud, but you did this like, okay, Lord. And you look back now and you go, whoa, wow, he did steer me around that. I mean, I, all logic said it should have been him. All logic said it should have went there. It's surrender. Hey, it's a prayer I pray almost every day. Like, Lord, if in any way we're off, just just take me out. Just crush me. Because at some point, it's all we can do. So is there an area in your life where you've not surrendered? And then this week, would you take some time today or sometime later this week and just spend some time reflecting on the question, why? Why not? What, what, are, you, what are you afraid of? Is it because you think you're an expert in that area? 
Is it because uh, you know, you've hit a wall on that road before and you have a hard time letting go? Why? Is it just because of neglect and you don't really think about it? Is there an area uh, where you've not surrendered? If you're not a Christian, if you're not a Christ follower, I really think this morning was uh, afforded you a fun opportunity to see what really it looks like. Because it's not a guarantee of a perfect life. It's not even a guarantee of a healthy life. It's not even a guarantee of a long life. It, it, it's, it's a God who says, you have a propensity to live paths of death. And I made you for paths of life. But getting on those paths isn't an issue of the ent- intellect. It's an issue of the heart. It's an issue of surrender. And so if you're not a Christ follower, you've heard us talk a lot about Jesus and getting saved and all these crazy terms that really mean nothing to the culture at large. Uh, It's all an attempt to recognize that Jesus came and and forgave us of sin and then said, let me, let me, let me show you. Let me, I'll be a model of what it looks like to surrender to God. And that's why we talk about following him is living life with the same disposition that he lives life with, the same heart he lives life with. So I'm going to give you a moment to reflect with God and everything we've done or think about what we've talked about or so Whatever, however you want to use this, I'm going to give you 30 seconds. And if you're someone who, you know, like you're like, yeah, I want to, just, I want to start following Jesus, then it's not, it's nothing magical about that. There's nothing ornate about that. It's it's a heart acknowledgement to God that that's the case. So why don't you just take a moment in the solitude of your chair, just reflect and talk to God, and then I'll close this up in a moment. Lord God, I just feel comfortable acknowledging that there's not a person in the room who would, wouldn't be here if there wasn't this desire to learn from you how to live, or at least a desire to check you out and consider learning from you how to live. And God, we as one just kind of say to you, we, we don't have this figured out. God, we recognize that, that we have a tendency to, to walk down paths that are leading uh, to places we don't want to be. And sometimes we see it and we walk anyway. And other times we, we don't even see it. God, our lives are complex. It's not just, you know, you. I mean, we, we've got lots going on, God. We've got this very bifurcated, divided lives and all these different responsibilities and all these different paths. And yet you are the God who repeatedly throughout the text in different ways in different times says just surrender all your ways to me so as we reflect on uh, Solomon and and his challenge to surrender to you in all of our ways his challenge that we need God more than we need information God, I just pray that you would help us see that where that's relevant in our lives Pray for the people who are already making bold decisions. That that you would embolden them, that you would give them courage, perseverance, and relational support as they make those decisions. God, we want to live these joy-filled, healthy lives. So it's in your name we pray, Jesus. Amen. Okay, a couple things before you go. As always, point you towards the info card. That's the, really the best way to communicate with us, whether you have comments or prayer requests or if you made a decision to follow Jesus or would like help in your relationship with Jesus, you can let us know there. There's a box out in the hallway. There's also some people wearing Ask Me uh, lanyards, and you can hand them to them. They don't, like, photocopy them and publish them. They keep them private, and we get them. Uh, we're also, uh, this is uh, crazy. This is, this is how wise your council is. They, this week said we should have digital ones of those online. And we went, whoa, yeah, that's brilliant. So we're working on that. Uh, anyway, that, was, that wasn't supposed to be a shot at the council. It was supposed to be sarcastic. Uh, okay, what else are we talking about? Uh, oh, yeah, and then there's the food drive thing. You might have saw the article in the paper and seen the email that, from us this week. But uh, apparently God's love uh, is out of food in their pantry. And we're not trying to overanalyze that or 
become any kind of experts in that area so much as to go, geez, Lord, we have people who say, give us organic needs to meet, and we would love to meet them. So next week, uh, our friend Steve's going to pull a nice truck up on the curb out there, and we're going to, you know, so you can bring some perishable food items, and we'll fill the back of the truck and get them to him. Sure love you guys, and like you, have a great week.